We acknowledge the Yuggera and Ghana nations as traditional custodians of the land on which we work, live and learn, and their continuing connection with the land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their elders past and present. All content related to this program is for general informational purposes only and contains stories and discussions around mental health that may be disturbing to some listeners. If you are concerned about yourself or someone you know, please seek professional individual advice and support. More details are contained in our show notes. Every morning in the Praise for Cheeses laboratory, researchers set up the maze for their two lab rats, Fred and Millie, whose purpose is to make the best choice available to them. Let's peer in on their conversation as Fred returns from his morning run. Hey, Freddy. How was the cheese this morning? (coughs) You know, same, same. Where did you go this time? (coughs) Okay, so I go down the corridor and take the first left. No, 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 no. What? You're going to tell me first left, second right, second left. But that's where the, that's where the cheese is. That's where the bad cheese is, Freddy. I'm telling you there's better cheese out there. You just need to open yourself to the possibility that there's something else out there and try a different path. Just use your nose. That's how I found it. If you keep doing the same thing, you're going to keep getting the same result. They're raising my barrier, Freddy. It's my turn. See you in a bit. As Millie follows the path she discovered to the good cheese, Fred expels the contents of the bad cheese from his stomach. Millie indeed has found the bountiful cheese platter and returns completely satisfied. Oh, man. Oh, Freddy. Did you vomit again? Oh, I'm sorry. That cheese was rank this morning. You must have noticed that. I'm telling you, the cheese I'm finding is way better than the cheese you're going to. Give it a try tomorrow. Uh, maybe. Next morning, Fred and Millie are ready to go again. Millie is first out of the gate this time and returns triumphant. Good cheese. Oh, my God. They had tasty blue vein and camembert this time. What? Same place as usual, Freddy. Try this. First on the right, first on the left, third on the right. Go get that tasty cheese. Here he goes. Fred is making his way down the corridor and... Oh, he's taking the first left instead of the first right. He's taking the path he always takes and... Oh, that's new. We haven't seen him vomit on the cheese before. He's making his way back. Quite slowly, it seems. How'd you go, Freddy? Wasn't that blue vein exquisite? I think I tasted a hint of charcoal. Freddy, you did get the good cheese this time, didn't you? (sighs) I remembered what you told me, but I still went first left. (gasps) No, Freddy. And it was the same old awful cheese. Well, at least you're not heaving today. I vomited as soon as I sniffed it. Mm. I couldn't even stomach a small nibble today. But you threw up everything yesterday. You were running on empty as it was. I'm tired. I just need to go to sleep. I mean, I know you say there's better cheese out there, but the cheese I'm going to is there well before you join me in this game. It's all I've ever known. But it's killing you, Freddy. Please. Why do you keep going back there when you know it's bad for you? I suppose I'm scared if I try something else, there won't be any cheese at all. Oh, just try my way, Freddy. I promise you won't be disappointed. But the next morning, the researchers decided to swap the cheeses around. Good morning, Freddy. Where are you going today? I suppose I can try your way. Looks like I'm first this morning. Indeed, Freddy has decided to try Millie's route this morning and he's found the cheese, but... Wait, he's sniffing it. Oh, poor Freddy. It's vomit town for him again, I'm afraid. I knew it was too good to be true. Here he is. Now how was that, Freddy? Millie, I don't know what you're on, but I went your way this morning and the cheese was just as rotten as always. I don't believe it. Are you sure you went first on the right, first on the left, third on the right? Yes. Watch out for my vom. Sorry. Your turn. Millie is out of the gate quite quickly this morning and taking her usual path and she can smell the bad cheese as soon as she rounds the last corner. But wait a minute, she's doubling back and trying Fred's usual pathway. Eureka! The good cheese is hers to enjoy. 
Hope you're able to eat around my vomit, okay? Now listen here, Freddy. I'm telling you this because I'm concerned about your welfare. Use your nose. What? You have to use all your senses and trust them. Yes, I went my usual way, but this time they had the bad cheese there. So I doubled back and went the way you normally go, and the good cheese was there this time. No f- Why? I'm over this, man. I just want some cheese. I'm telling you, it's out there. You just have to believe it's there and then go out and look for it. Stop taking the first cheese you find, Freddy, especially if it smells bad. I don't know if I've got the energy for this. And indeed, Fred's energy stores were low. Two days have now passed since he was able to keep even the smallest part of bad cheese down. Time is running out for our poor Freddy. Next morning, the researchers put the cheeses back into their original places. Millie is returning from her run. Well? Okay, so they switched the good cheese back to where it normally is. Go get it, Freddy! I don't know, Millie. I mean, I've been to both locations now and there's bad cheese in both places. Maybe I just don't have the stomach for cheese anymore. Maybe there's no actual difference. Freddy, I'm only going to say this because I love you. But stop the f*** out of it. Use your nose and if it smells bad, go to the next place. What harm is there in trying? (sighs) Okay, one last time. Freddy is moving very slowly this morning. The researchers are furiously taking notes as he wanders down his well-trodden path. But as he approaches, something peculiar. He stopped before he got all the way to the chunk of rancid cheese. He's turning away. He's backtracking. It looks like Freddy is sniffing his way into the passageways Millie took. Eureka! He's found the good cheese, and he's really chomping in. Don't eat too much, Freddy, or you might... He's much more lively now as he turns back to the common area. How'd you go, Freddy? I vomited. (gasps) No! But I found the good cheese, Billy! I used my nose! Say thank you, Billy! Freddy? Freddy! Uh, Oh, what luck. Bad luck, I'm afraid. It appears the researcher's other experiment, Schrodinger's cat, has escaped the box and was indeed alive and very, very hungry. Poor Freddy. Well, the cat's out of the bag now, Andy, by the sounds of it. Schrodinger's cat of all cats. (laughs) Poor Freddy. (laughs) Despite all his rage, he was still just a rat in a cage. Oh, I can't believe you finally got one of our music (laughs) references. (laughs) How could I miss it after our music episode a couple of weeks ago? um, Smashing Pumpkins reference, circa, what, 1995. I'm in there. Somewhere around there. And I think that would classify as a heavy metal track. So, you know, obviously we do like a bit of heavy metal. Look, we're not going to start the uh, Is Silverchair grunge or heavy metal debate again. This time, maybe maybe we can play the heavy metal at poor Freddy's wake. Mm. Mm. Imagine what could have happened for Freddy if he'd leaned into possibility instead. <laughs> this is Reframe of Mind. Where we deep dive into discussions about mental health, joined by some of Australia's leading minds to expand our understanding of the world and ourselves. Because we don't exist in a vacuum, and the way we talk about mental health shouldn't either. We're your hosts, Louise Poole and Andy Leroy. Sometimes it feels like our troubleshooting mind gets out of control and before long, we're down a rabbit hole or in a rat's maze of limitation, unable to unstick ourselves from a bad situation. Stop rhyming. It's not the music episode. (laughs) God, help it. No more. (laughs) Last time on Reframe of Mind, we met public speaker and entrepreneur Lucy Bloom, who shared her secret for getting on with things in the face of adversity. Confront the worst case scenario and then scrunch it up in a ball, flush it down the loo and then start focusing on the best case scenario. That's what I do when things are a bit out of my control, when I can't control the worst case scenario happening. I almost fantasise about the best case scenario because I have just as much control over that. I had a really serious motorcycle accident. It looked like I was going to lose my leg, but the care of my leg was out of my hands. It wasn't up to me to make the decisions or perform the surgery that would or wouldn't save my leg. That's really hard to surrender to, to just go under a general anaesthetic. Not sure if you're going to wake up with one leg or two is true surrender. So because that was all out of my control, it took a year, a week and a day to save my leg. I found myself consciously taking my thoughts out of the worry, the anxiety and the worst case scenarios 
and pushing them towards not even the best case, total fantasy land. And that's because it feels better. That's where I find myself always seeking what feels better. It felt better to fantasise and plan. On the surface of things, it would be really easy to read this as a hollow platitude, best friend of toxic positivity. But we do not like toxic positivity and reframe of mind. Oh, no. No, no. They are no friend of ours. Mm. So Lucy's active pursuit of fantasising about the positive instead of dwelling on the negative, it came with an important distinction. In some cases, we have just as much control of things going right as going wrong. So we might as well fantasise about what could go right instead. Yeah, you know, and looking at both of our stories so far, you know, mm. we're now 29 episodes into the first season of Reframe of Mind. Huzzah. And yeah, I know, right? You've been dealing, you know, with the with leaving your career of 26 years in radio mm. and the implications of that psychologically and emotionally for you. I've been dealing with the emotional trauma of a really huge change in family dynamics. So we've been talking a lot about emotional well-being, which, you know, is obviously what we set out to do. But what happens when something physical is linked to that mm. outside of those psychological impacts, you know? Mental so we've health had, is not just in our mind. It's in I the world know. around us, including our bodies. What? what? <laughs> <laughs> So let's just focus back on Lucy for a second. When she was thinking this about that she has just as much control over what could go right as what could go wrong, she didn't know whether she'd have to have a foot amputated. Yeah. And she didn't know that if she didn't have to have the foot amputated, how, if at all, that was going to impact on her future mobility. We've had other guests who have had limbs amputated, who have lost mobility completely. Derek McManus was shot 14 times in under a minute. There's a lot of physical stuff going on mm. there that, you know, is woven into a psychological or emotional or mental outcome for all of these guests and for us as well. As much as it was a little joke before about our mental health existing outside of our minds, it's true. We cannot get around in this world and not be influenced by the rest of the world around us in terms of mental health. And the thing that we're carrying with us everywhere we go is our body. So mm. if something you feel like is, there's a physicality about you that is affecting you, whether it's a chronic pain or a disability or a condition that's happened to you, of course it's going to affect your mental health. So mm. as we put together our conversation with Lucy against some of the other people we've spoken to, particularly from a scientific background, it really made us look at how the physical implications affect our mental health. And vice versa. Yeah, and as we started putting this series together, we actually noticed that there were some conversations starting to emerge around the subject of stroke and stroke recovery. Mm. So what we've done this time around is brought together two perspectives for this episode. Firstly, from someone who has first-hand experience helping her mum recover from the damaging effects of stroke and a brain aneurysm. Elite marathon runner Lisa Tarmody, who recounted the impact of dealing with a raft of negative prognoses. Five years ago, my mum had a massive aneurysm. I don't know if you know that story or not. but yeah. um, mm. So she was left at the age of 74, well, fighting for her life for a start as they didn't think she'd survive. When she did, she, uh, she was in and out of coma for a number of weeks. And when she did survive and come out the other end of the coma, she had massive brain damage and hardly any higher function mentally. So she had no control over her body or anything. Now, I'm suddenly confronted, you know, I've been up until that point, this, you know, selfish, goal-orientated athlete. Mum was always supporting me and, you know, looking out for me and helping me. I was running my businesses and so on, but I was very much, I could do what I wanted. And, and then this situation happened and we were left, you know, being told that she would never do anything again, that the brain damage was so massive, she would never have any quality of life or do anything and to put her in an institution. And I was just like, no, that's not happening. And so that, at that point I had to stop training and running, obviously, um, and doing the long stuff. I still looked after myself self-care wise, mm. but I put all of my energies and focus into her rehabilitation and even though I was told there was no hope and there is no way forward and just forget it make her comfortable I said well I don't do comfortable for a start <laughs> and if if that's the option then I'd rather go down fighting if I'm going to go down so I started to research and study and I came across something called hyperbaric oxygen therapy which was hugely beneficial in her case with a brain injury and a very underrated therapy in general and I got her access to to this and I, she couldn't even sit or put food in her mouth or chew or, or, or speak or know who I am. She had nothing. I, I spent I spent now five and a half years. It took me two and a half years basically to get her back to normal. Thousands and thousands of hours of retraining her 
your brain, uh, studying neuroplasticity, uh, epigenetics, functional neurology, physio, you name it, I studied it and stayed one step ahead of her in her rehabilitation process. And at every step of the way, especially in the early stages, I would get criticized to hell by people telling me, like, why are you putting her through such an arduous, torturous regime? Because what I was doing was quite difficult, you know, it was harsh. And it was, and it was a, you know, she had to relearn things from scratch. So it was just absolutely sometimes really, really tough to watch the stuff mm-hmm. I had to put her through. But I knew that the alternative was death. And so that for me was just with, you know, that's not an option. I'm, 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 I'm going to throw everything at, at this thing or I'm, I'm going to get it back or die trying was my attitude. Mm-hmm. So I went all in. And Professor Leanne Carey is a world-leading Australian neuroscientist in occupational therapy and stroke rehabilitation and recovery research. She set out with a mission to bust some commonly held beliefs about brain function and its capacity to recover. Very early in the piece as an occupational therapist, um, I was working with a young stroke survivor who was um, a dental nurse. She had great movement but had little or no sensation. And so for her to be able to go back to work or engage or even to wear slightly high shoes Mm -hmm. or something like that was just an impossibility. Imagine trying to hold the dental tools and pass them across to the dentist. And at that time, basically, was the belief that the brain was um, a hardwired and there was little or no change and that if you had a sensory loss she just had a poorer outcome and I didn't think that was good enough (laughs) and so you know I'd seen changes in the movement and things like that and so I really saw that this was a, a limitation for many people that should have potential for change. Um, so basically, I, I did various things, including take myself across to the States for a six-month study tour, talked with all the people that had Norman George talks about in his brain that changes itself, as I did that back in the 80s, and, and then just continued to use it and see how I could hands-on apply it to this situation. So if no one's heard of neuroplasticity before, how would you explain it to them? Neuroplasticity, it's about that ability of the nervous system to respond to stimuli by reorganizing its structure, function, and connection. So it's essentially that underlying phenomenon that allows us to change, adapt and learn. So and it's one thing too I, that's important to remember in this is that it's the changes are experience and learning dependent. They occur during development, throughout the normal lifespan and actually in response to injury. And actually There's probably already a number of your listeners that might have heard about the concept of neuroplasticity. Mm. And it's in things like the book um, The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Doidge. Yeah, that was the first place I heard it. Yeah. Yeah. And on the television series, for example, Redesign My Brain by Todd Sampson. So I think um, the knowledge that the brain can change, this concept of neuroplasticity is now becoming mainstream. It's important for us all to know that the brain's changing its function and networks constantly, whatever we do, even now. How much does our brain have the ability to change at different life points? Is my brain more neuroplastic now than it was 10 years ago or am I getting worse? Look, I think the thing is that we we there's really compelling evidence now that the brain can change that has this neuroplastic capacity throughout the lifespan. So whilst a person is younger, there might be more rapid changes, we can still change throughout the lifespan. And I think this is really so crucial when we're working with different people at different life stages to to know that there's this possibility. And the people, for example, that I work with who have a stroke, that it really provides a hope for change. In her plight to help her mum, Lisa also set out to challenge some commonly held opinions. You have to be willing to put the hard yards in and risk risk failure despite all that. But have you got any other alternatives? If you don't, then this is the only way forward if you're willing to go through and sacrifice what it will take to do this. And that's the conversations that I, you know, that I find really difficult when people don't have 
what it takes to push through those barriers and that makes me so sad you know because there are you know especially in, in the rehabilitation space there are people that could have come back that could have survived that could have maybe had a chance had they been given the right resources the right information and a lot of that information is already out in the world it's not like we're waiting for stuff this is this is stuff that's already known but not necessarily available in your local you know hospital or your yeah. local doctors and that's not their fault it's just that the world is changing so rapidly the research is going so fast uh, that we no one person can keep up with it but if you're willing to put in the hard yards you might have a chance of finding somebody in the world who's fixed this before or helped with this so talking about stroke recovery and rehabilitation, mm. it's very specific and it's not something that I don't think Andy or I can personally relate to in terms of having been through uh, an event like that where we have to go through such a, a long process of rehabilitation and relearning. Mm. Look, I think, you know, and we don't want to draw too long a bow here, but when we're talking about brain plasticity, let's talk about our friend Freddie from the sketch for a second because mm. Freddie was really ingrained in those behaviours, wasn't he? He was actually, no matter what anybody said, he would just automatically go down that pathway. And then eventually he tried a new pathway, but it took some effort to actually go onto that. So his brain needed to make the link to go somewhere else, even though his automatic senses were saying go this way. So I don't know, for me, it seems like brain plasticity comes into the mental health conversation in saying that if we are open to the possibility of something different, then we might try it and it might actually have a different outcome. I think there's so many amazing insights that we can gain from Lisa Tarmody and Leanne Carey's work for ourselves, mm. for our own mental health and, and the mental health of people around us because, yes, we're talking about an extreme and specific incident, but that research at the basis of it that underpins it about our ability to change and create those new pathways and leave behind the things that didn't work and relearn mm. something new is something that's really valuable to everybody. And this isn't just about making a choice of, you know, something that might be more useful to think. This is actually a physical representation or a, a physical proof of the brain actually being able to make new neural pathways mm. and to actually do something different and to relearn. So I think it's actually quite exciting around yeah. when you're thinking about depression, for example, like what are the implications there? What what are the, the ways that this research can be transferred across to chronic illnesses like depression? and anxiety is our brain capable of relearning a different way to not do those things that it does i hope so <laughs> mm. i would love to think that my brain could learn um a, a, another way of being for all the things that i've done in the past or thought in the past that haven't been particularly helpful or healthy for me i i think that the possibility to use the lucy bloom of it all to lean into the possibility to fantasize that there is a better solution, that we won't always be trapped in those patterns of thought and those core beliefs that we've held, that it's not just toxic positivity. If, if we start telling different stories about ourselves, if we try to look for the good in things, that there's actually scientific evidence that backs mm. up that it can change um, incrementally it can lead to us being who we want to be. And I think importantly as well, you know, when it comes to toxic positivity, you'll generally find that there is no changed outcome, that things are just the same as just somebody sitting amongst it saying, oh, well, it could be worse. But what we're talking about here is actually making a change and deciding to entertain the idea, at least in the beginning, that something could be different if we try something different. So the proof's always going to be in the pudding, isn't it? You know, if you try something different and it still doesn't work, then try something else. I think that phrase is now the proof is in the cheese. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> if you're still vomiting by the end of your second choice, try something else. <laughs> try another flavour. <laughs> um, so relating this research to my mental health journey, there's a lot of things that stand out that Leanne has said about paving those new pathways. I remember mm. when... And, you know, we are 29 episodes in and I, I feel like it's been a while since we, we touched on depression. We've been having a bit of fun with music. We, <laughs> that, we, we kind of lost the plot with music. We, we, <laughs> Lovely diversion. <laughs> we have been having a bit of fun. Not that depression is not a, a riotously fun thing, of course. <laughs> <laughs> But when we started the series, I was in a place where I'd been suffering from many periods of debilitating depression. And 
at the end, at the one where we started the series, it came around a time where I also walked away from my former career as a radio announcer, radio person, my career in the media like that of 26 years that I'd built my identity around. And that's all a bit of a shock, isn't it? Because you do something for so long and suddenly we start to enter this mode of automatic pilot. Yeah. And so without reactivating the drama, the trauma of the, the, those first few episodes, which I found myself describing as quite dark to somebody who was starting the podcast the other day. I'm thinking, you know, the first few episodes are quite dark. Just, I mean, we get lighter and then darker and then lighter, but the first ones are quite dark. The first ones are quite dark. The first ones are quite dark because I was feeling quite dark. And I can say that I'm not in the same place now that I was at that period of time there was this great, this book I saw once and it had illustrations in it of emotions. Maybe it's like the visual representation of the sketches that we do at the front. And it had a cartoon and it said, this is what depression feels like. And it was basically a really, really long hole in the ground, like a long shaft. And there was a person in the bottom and it was just all darkness and mm. someone up the top just reaching out a hand. And all around the top, there was light, but it was too far to reach. There was too much darkness to to climb from where they were. So really, the, the light's not that far away, but the, that tunnel of the darkness feels very, very long. Mm. Um and so when we're talking about the stuff that happened in, you know, those early episodes of the series, we're talking about me feeling like I was down the bottom of that dark tunnel before I ended that career. And also after in trying mm. to reevaluate and trying to work out who I was. So even though some of those actions like deciding that I had more value and wanting to live authentically were things that I wanted and resulted in me making decisions that ended that radio career, even though sometimes that felt empowering because I was finally standing up for myself, finally making that change that I wanted to change. It was also dark and depressing and it wasn't always empowering, especially afterwards. We've spoken before about feeling like I couldn't leave the house. Um mm. Like I couldn't leave the yard about literally not going beyond the gate. There were some things that went on during that time that actually called back to my previous experiences and things that were said that were, and I'm being very vague, but horrible. Literally, I could not get them out of my head. And I laid in, I remember laying in bed one week, not being able to get certain words and phrases out of my head because they just kept mm. playing on a loop and wouldn't stop. And mm. that's debilitating. Yeah, it is completely. Yeah, you know, from my perspective with, you know, I talk about this change in family dynamics. There's a relative that said some pretty awful things to me and different to you where, you know, for you, those words rang through your head and wouldn't leave you alone. For me, it was less about that and more about if I actually reject those comments in the way, the only way that I know how, which is to cut them off, then what was playing through my mind was all of the expectations around how family should be and how mm. family should treat each other. And yet within that twisted kind of view, that kind of Disney-fied, you must have a happy ending to mm. all of this kind of ideal, the only way that I could actually achieve that would be if I gave away my power and said, okay, I forgive you, whatever, but don't do it again. It would happen again. Yeah. And, you know, as Joe Fogus has pointed out to us before in an episode way back, <laughs> we can stop people from saying things, but it doesn't stop them from thinking it. Yeah. So if they're going to think that about me anyway, how valuable is that relationship? What value does it give me to have somebody who thinks so poorly of me? Why should I actually make the effort to try and heal that? Because it takes two. I can't go and fix that. And the only way I think in their mind that it's going to be fixed is if I say, yes, I am the asshole. Yes, I did say those things. Yes, whatever. But that doesn't work for me either. I, I, I really had to come to change my beliefs around what was acceptable as far as family relations go. And for me, it's not acceptable to be, to be treated like that. Mm. It's not acceptable for anybody to treat or talk to anybody like that. And if they want to be a part of my life, then they need to treat me with respect. So from my perspective, brain plasticity comes into that because I need to teach my brain to think in a different way when it comes to family mm. because my default is to say, look, okay, now the heat's out of it. We just need to go back, say sorry, and move on. But there's a lot within that sorry that needs to happen. And I need to, number one, treat myself better 
and stop defaulting to that position that I'm to blame. And I also need to change my position in my brain, expecting things to resolve, expecting things to actually just go back to the set point because realistically they can't. Mm. You yeah. know? And that's not an easy thing. Like I talked about how I would journal every morning and I was journaling about these issues and these problems and finding ways and trying to find ways to actually help myself through it. And a big part of that was actually changing the way I think about it because while I was doing that, I was actually coming to an agreement with myself that I wasn't going to go back and I was going to fight because a fight wasn't going to achieve anything for me, nor was I going to go back and just pretend things didn't happen because dismissing things or not acknowledging things or what's the word I'm looking for, just brushing things off doesn't work mm. either. So I needed to find a different way. I needed to find another way to respond, which I didn't know how. Honestly, I'll put my hand up and say, no one taught me that. I don't know how I've learned the best I can from what I've observed growing yeah. up and from the relationships I've had, but I need to do something differently. Yeah, because if we keep doing the same thing, we keep getting the same result. You bet. It's, it's a hard conversation because from, I mean, from my depressive point at that time, there's the element of the physicality and the, the chemical imbalance that goes on in your body when you're experiencing those extreme emotions. So why I'm always happy to chuck toxic positivity out is because you can't give enough platitudes to cover up the way that you really feel and the way that your body is reacting and and all those things mm. like you know sticking a platitude over it doesn't change the fact that you're dopamine deficient so when i think about those times of being down the dark hole i don't know that there's there's not a big recognition like if someone said to me if if we had had a conversation with Leanne Carey at that point and she'd said you know the brain plasticity is incredible and you can pave yourself a new pathway i don't know if i would have believed it was possible because it was that's a that's a big that's a big jump to make big leap yeah big big leap the, we're not the, suggesting that anybody goes off their meds and just goes oh i'll just create a new pathway that no no I, no no be, I, yeah. I was actually going to say that it's actually the opposite to that because mm. I, I would say it's glimmers when you're in the dark place there might be the the teensiest faintest bit of refracted light as a passing glimmer or a shadow on the wall or something and if you can do your best to hold that maybe you can slowly find more and more light and so mm. in that context some of those things for me for changing the brain involved changing the thoughts I had around medication around my resistance to medication too because I've said before that I had a number of depressive episodes in my life and I never medicated for any of them I just I think I just packed up my life moved it somewhere else and and put it in a box under the bed until it all came back again which it does if you don't look at things but I think that some of the first movements I made in terms of changing the pathways in my brain was saying it's okay to try medication mm. it, might work. There's a possibility that this could make it better and there's a possibility that it might not. But what if it helped instead? What if it made it slightly better? And then that pathway leads to another pathway where, okay, that did help a little bit. Is there something else I can do? Mm. Because if that helped, maybe something else will help. Maybe there's a different medication, maybe a change in the dose. Maybe it can help me get some space to work on some other things. Maybe some of the other techniques that are being suggested to me by people who know about this stuff or who have experience and have lived down here before, maybe some of those might work. All of them might not, but some of them might. And it kind of slowly carves out a new pathway from that. So you don't get to, I'm you know, on the floor of the shower with the razor blade in one day to, let's make a new brain the next day. Mm. Mm -mm. It's those small incremental changes to build a new pathway and it well, is you know, like, possible. Like Nathan Parker told us, you take one small step, you take one small thing that you can achieve and then you can build on it. Yeah, like those months after I left that job, let's the end of 2020, which is when this was. So I left that job in August 2020 mm -hmm. and we decided to start the business, Welcome Change Media, our business between Andy and I at the start of 2021. Have I got the timelines right? I do, don't I? You do, you do. In that time, we were talking about before we decided to turn it into a business, I, you know, I left that job. I had absolutely no plan. I didn't have a business. I had a whole heap of bad mental health and a feeling like I just fucking couldn't 
anymore and had to dissolve the situation that I was in. But I we were having those conversations. We were going, what could we make together? We haven't made anything together in a long time. Um, and those conversations came up for us with you and because it hadn't been that long since your dad died. And so no. we, were, we were talking a lot about the grief of that. And I was feeling definitely yeah. that grief at the loss of a career. And there was a sense that I think for me anyway, when we were talking about grief as well, that there was a sense that, okay, there's this grief period and then we can sort of look at how long does it take to return to normal? Yeah. Like to some kind of Never magic happens. end points. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler and, alert. You know, I think we've kind of grown a bit since then. <laughs> I think we've kind of come to a few realizations in between. Yeah. Those first few moments, those are the those are the glimmers as well before we had a business, before we have this podcast that we have now. Those were the glimmers that paved that way in the plasticity because that six month period of time, I we, we would have a chat actually. Andy and I would have a chat most Sundays about what we were mm. going to do with the podcast and we'd start to plan out our episodes and what kind of themes that we might like to have. And we'd give each other some tasks. We'd assign some tasks throughout the week. And <laughs> do you know what? Andy would do his tasks and you know what I would do is I would sit in bed all week upset and not do anything and then Sunday would come along and we'd have a chat and I'd be like, oh, I was busy, I didn't get to it. But the truth I is like, you tasks. know, I didn't. I didn't I didn't do them because that was the the depressiveness of it. So those small conversations that led to bigger ideas, that led to us putting this project where we both put our mental health and healing at the heart of our business model and at the heart of the content that we produce for ourselves and making it important to us that when we work with other people that they're also making content that we believe will help make the world better and improve people's mm. lives. Those incremental moments all up really help pave that pathway too, you know, like we hadn't even considered talking to Leanne Carey about stroke rehabilitation and brain plasticity and, and changing and on a big subject like that when we were making those small decisions. We were just going to make our little podcast and it we was just, just a, side, make our little podcast. It was a side hustle on a Sunday. We were just going to make our little podcast. Yeah. And then I thought, I'm going to leave the bank. I need a bit more control over my life. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I thought, oh, he's going to make me put on pants and work every day. And you know mm, what? That still hasn't happened. Hasn't happened. Still don't put on pants. <laughs> still haven't put on pants. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so so those kind of changes they they happen. The small there's that, that potential of possibility, and and it, it creates that new pathway where it gets easier and it gets easier and it gets a little easier. And it's not always easy. When I say easier, because for many 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 months into us starting the the business and this podcast, I would say to Andy, one of the things that I'm really afraid of is that I just think that depression is lurking around the corner. That I might be okay now, but something's going to happen soon or something's going to mm. trip me and it's going to send me back down that path and I don't want to be there because it's a fucking horrible place to be. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is a fucking horrible place to be. And, you know, you talk about those incremental changes and I think in any circumstance, I think it's those incremental changes when you're trying to battle something so big. It's those little changes, small steps at a time that actually you can start to build into that mm. roadway of recovery as well. Like yeah. we celebrated the first time that I left the house. We did. The that first, was a big thing. The first time that I went back into the city after, you know, having not been in the city for so long. And I know we've celebrated before as well when you've received letters from people and it's not affected you emotionally like you. Yeah, that's true. Like early on, I was getting communication from people related to the relative <laughs> I don't know, isn't it funny like talking about all this sort of shit and not actually naming people, but I'd get letters and they weren't particularly good and they would throw me. But then as time went on, I would get letters from her and there came a point where I didn't get triggered anymore mm. because I'd made that change within my own mind as to what was acceptable and I wasn't about to be manipulated down the same pathway of being hurt or being convinced that I was to blame for everything because I saw that happen far too many times with other people in my life and I was going to be a party to that. You know what I say, trauma's trauma, right? Whether it's a an envelope full of cutlery or a end of a career, whatever whatever has affected you has affected you. Yeah, trauma is trauma. And you know, I wonder whether from a brain perspective, whether physical trauma is similar in some ways to psychological trauma. Yeah. One of those things that Professor Leanne Carey 
spoke to us about was that as counterintuitive as it sounds, people who have suffered stroke are actually in a prime position to recover because their brain plasticity is improved following the trauma of stroke. The plasticity is enhanced by an injury like that. Mm. So it does have a special significance for a person who's had a, had a stroke. They're sort of challenge to move and think and feel with an altered brain and body. And this phenomenon really opens a window to change and adaptation really in the days, weeks, months, and even years after stroke. I often say to the people with stroke that I work with, they actually have an even greater capacity for change and adaption because of that injury. And they can learn new skills on a day-to-day basis like we can, but we have to also be aware that they could learn habits and movements that are not so helpful, such as they might learn not to use that limb. So whilst there's a greater capacity, it's also important that we really work to harness that capacity for a positive change. It really does seem counterintuitive that the brain becomes more plastic, or more more able to cope with learning and change after an injury like stroke. So how do you help people, not only the people who have suffered the stroke themselves, but the people who are supporting them to accept the possibility of recovery in place of being resigned to that of permanent disability? Well, I think if we think about how the brain works, it works in networks and in an interconnected way. So if part of that network has been damaged by the stroke, then there's the other parts of the network that need to reconnect to make up for that loss. And that's, I suppose, where that readiness and the presence of neuroplastic change is intensified after a stroke because we know that that plasticity is linked with experience and learning. So then whilst there has been damage somewhere, if you can see that you can put to the person that the brain has this capacity for change, that it's ongoing the whole time, and really what we need to come together about is how we can shape the change in a way that meets the goals and the new challenges that that person is being presented with. So it really is being very concrete that there is hope because of this phenomenon of neuroplasticity of the brain and because the fact that the brain isn't our ability to do things is not just linked with one area of the brain it's linked with networks and there's redundancies and capacities to reconnect and reorganize those networks to achieve a better outcome might not be exactly the same as it was before but to achieve the goal that the person's um aiming for. Lisa Tarmody managed to nurse her mother back to full health after she suffered a brain aneurysm and then a stroke while on the operating table to address the aneurysm. When you're up against all the odds and when everybody's telling you there is no way forward, you know, they're not always right. And that if you're up against it and you have no other options, why not throw the bus at this, you know, and go all in. And that was, you know, especially when you love somebody, you know, there's a pretty big motivating factor there. And so that's what I did. And and now, you know, my mum is just loving life again. And I think that's an example of resilience and an example of being able to adapt to change, you know. I had to be relentless mm. and I'm mm. still relentless. Like she has n- never has a day off training, <laughs> never. You know, uh, she, you know, her birthdays, Christmas, whatever, she's training every day and she has to because she's now 79 and I need to keep her there. And I'm determined to keep her there and as healthy for as long as I possibly can because I selfishly want my mum around, you know. (laughs) Was it a case for you that you felt like you wanted to prove them wrong as well? Did it come back to that attitude for you or was there something else there that that helped to drive you and your mum? I mean, the main main driver was love and Mm. that my mum and my family are my always my number one priority in everything I do. But there's definitely, you know, when I was told there is no way, I've been told my entire life that you can't do that and that's impossible and who the hell do you think you are and you don't know. And so I just don't ever even listen to naysayers. I just, 
I just tune all that out. And I, I think I definitely have a rebel spirit. I do like proving people wrong. And, and I use that as a motivating force sometimes. Mm. When I'm in mm. despair and when I don't think I can carry on, I think of that person who just told me I couldn't. And I go, well, you're going to let them prove you them right, you know, or are you going to keep going? With mum, it was easily to, easy to be motivated because, you know, I was just desperate. Mm. And she's she was, you know, just an amazing mother, you know, just a phenomenal mother. Hey there, just wanted to take a little breather from today's episode and say thank you so much for listening to us. Make sure you never miss an episode by hitting the follow button on your podcast app now. And while you're there, we'd love it if you left us a review. It really does help to boost us so we can reach even more people. You can also check out our Patreon page to see how you can access even more content at patreon.com forward slash reframe of mind. And remember to tell everyone you know about us because the more people we get talking about mental health, the more supported we'll all be. And Leanne's work, as we discovered in episode 22 of Reframe of Mind, The Science of Changing Our Thinking, has resulted in some groundbreaking therapeutic treatment for stroke survivors called Sense Therapy. It's tried, tested and widely available and Leanne walked us through exactly how it works. I'm really curious about the process involved with bringing back sensation and movement because for me, my experience of knowing people who have suffered stroke and mm. and working with them, they don't have that movement in their in their limbs. So there was one lady I worked with who didn't have any movement in her left arm. So the therapy was more based around trying to compensate for that and give her mobility in other ways. But what you seem to be suggesting is that this person, you know, with the right kind of therapy and attention, might have been able to regain the sense of touch and some use in that limb. How does that? How do you go from zero movements to being able to have a functioning limb again? Well, perhaps if I can give the example in the sensation field, which is particularly where we're um, looking at. So the question is, how can you go from something that's almost not there to be able to restore a function and then use it? And that's often the case um, for a person who has loss of sensation. Uh, it's like the hand's blind. They can hardly feel or tune into the sensation or make sense of that altered information. So what we do is we can set up very special learning situations to help them to go to tune into some sensation that's there and to make sense of it. So, for example, even in the beginning, a person might only just feel that there's something there rather than nothing. So then we use the knowledge of the network that supports the processing of sensation to help enhance that experience. So one example might be we use anticipation. So in this way, we use deliberate anticipation to help ready the person to know what to expect to feel from priming them or helping them to tune into that sensation. And often they'll then get this aha a moment. Ah, oh, there's something there. And then we'll go through the process with them to help make sense of that altered information. And that might be where we use a concept called calibration where we help the person to experience that altered sensation by reference to a more normal sensation that they can experience with the other hand and with vision. So they get a chance to directly match what the feeling is compared with the other hand and with vision. And we know that when we normally experience a sensation, all those types of information come together and it increases the signal input and the intensity so the person can learn to make sense of that altered information. So they're just two features of seven principles of sense training that we use and each of the principles are very directly linked or mapped to this knowledge of how the brain can learn and adapt and change. It's important to know that the sensors in their fingertips are still working. It's just the direct uh, the area of the brain, the problem with the brain um, making sense of that. And whilst there might have been damage to a particular 
region of the brain that that's occurred with, there are supporting areas and networks in the brain that we can help the person to learn to make sense, to tune into the altered sensation um, by priming it and then to help make sense of that altered information. So very much aiming to take a more learning or restorative rather than compensation. And unfortunately, compensation has been the approach for many people to date. I think that's a really interesting distinction you've made there between it being an issue with the brain, not being able to interpret something that's still working, because perhaps, you know, in our best intentions, we maybe confuse this type of damage with something like nerve damage or some other kind of cognitive issue that that can happen along the way. Yeah, that's a really important distinction. And when we work with clients where this is a challenge, we make some of those distinctions very clear for them. So then they've got a basis to really have a buy-in to be involved in an approach to training that will help them to regain a sense of touch and then use it and that there's very real capability. This is the neurobiology of how our brain works and it does work. We see those changes. We see the improvements not only in the person's ability to discriminate textures or objects or know where their hands are and are in space on quite standard and formal tests, but also then how they can use that in the context of everyday tasks. And it might be worth at that point just to mention there's different types of neural plasticity that we can tap Mm. into in stroke rehab. One that we often think of is experience dependent, and that's where you're thinking more of enriched environments and spontaneous um, changes in plasticity of the brain. But what we're really targeting in therapy are two others. One is learning dependent, and that's where we're focusing on skill training. So that might be learning to pick up differences in textures like I mentioned or learning to grasp a cup in a more normal manner following that loss of movement and here we're looking at the relatively lasting changes in both knowledge and skill and the second level that sometimes people forget about is what we call activity dependent plasticity and this involves sort of more a strategy learning and what they call metacognitive strategies and this is where the person can when they apply the new skill to their everyday task really go through the discovery process of how to use that skill and how to perform it in the task and then they've got this new capability which they can bring to novel tasks. But it's not just about road exercises. Leanne pointed out the importance of a good relationship between the patient and the therapist. How important is the concept of being able to encourage yourself through all of this? I can imagine, you know, there must be quite a few barriers for someone who's experiencing this type of um, limitation. Mm. How, how do we go about helping them to encourage themselves? I think that's a really important part. And I think there's also encourage themselves, but there's also a partnership that is formed in, in this training. And a lot of people are really challenged by a sensory loss and some of the cognitive and emotional challenges um, that go with it. So perhaps if we think about where it starts, it's actually hard to imagine what it might be like if you can't feel down one side of your body. If you can't feel if an object's in your hand, um, you can't feel where your arm is, if it's behind your back or able to reach into your pocket, etc. So with that, people can often refer, you know, it can be quite distressing and yet it's a hidden problem uh, and they lose that sort of connection. So one big step of the way is for the person to feel safe and supportive in that first space and to acknowledge some of those demands and perhaps even those emotional problems with the experience of the altered sensation. But what we've also heard from these people is that they report that harnessing the positivity in the relationship is important and seeing the specialised therapy as a vehicle to help make 
that change. When people come in with a more open mindset to the treatment that the recovery time is faster? I don't know that we've sort of directly had an opportunity to um, test that, yeah. but w- we do take time in the beginning to really work with the person to understand where they're at, to understand this capability for change and to really look at getting that buy-in. And I think that's important. And so people engage really intensively in it and they've often said, you know, it's hard work and, and, you know, they're quite tired afterwards but they're prepared to do it because they can see um, some of the challenges some have talked about it feels like I'm you know going back to school and you <laughs> kid at school and everything's just so hard I mean maybe that's that's some of the um, you know even when one of the comments has said it was challenging but I wouldn't have changed mm. it I knew then it was working that same person saying it's like we're wiring your brain that sort of thing does depression play a role in the neuroplasticity? We we do actually measure people's depression and such along the way. The extent to which it directly impacts the neuroplasticity, I'm probably not in a position to really give you a, a very clear act background on that, but mm. I think it the emotional part directly impacts on obviously how the person engaged. We also know that mood and cognition are very distributed parts of the brain that support learning and engagement. So from that point of view, they can, um, they can contribute to the extent to which the neuroplasticity might play out. But I think that the, the other thing is that people then who might have had some emotional problems and some anxiety associated with it can definitely still benefit from the therapy and I'm thinking as I'm talking some people involved that have really made uh, very important gains from that that part of it and even again I I picked out a couple of comments here you know, with that shared vision of effort and change where someone said, we both worked so hard, so, so hard, like we really gave it our all. Or another person who said, look, we all done it. The help of the therapist, because if by themselves, forget it. So Mm. maybe sometimes those people will need just that extra scaffolding earlier because there can be quite a grief and a sadness sort of linking with the loss. But then when they're showing, they often have also reported the positive emotions when they see the improvements associated with the training and that they can connect back with that and with some confidence and being able to take back some of that choice in how they use their arm in daily activities. One of the first things that in, is involved in the process is focusing on tuning into the sensations that you still have. How does that go when, as humans, we have, I suppose, spent a lot of time not focusing on things, um, especially listening to our own bodies? What is what is that process yeah. like in actually breaching that gap? Yeah, no, that's a really good point, um, Louise, and one that a lot of um, people who are involved in the pro- program comment on. They say, oh, I hadn't realised how my senses work before or um, how important the sensation is and how they can tune into it. So we we have very specialised training sorts of tasks and activities. So, for example, from feeling different textures to even knowing where your limb is in space. So, for example, we have an apparatus where we can hold the hand in a comfortable position and move it back and forward and then they can get feedback from a protractor to know and understand better where their limb is in space and then they connect with that and then sort of internalise um, that knowledge of where their limb is, sort of like a new internal scale of that mm. sensation. And people get incredibly engaged in that. And we, we've, we've actually had the opportunity to um, get some input from 
people who have been involved in it and one person said it was from a completely different type of thinking and processing than I'd ever been used to. It was always a positive thing, it was challenging but I wouldn't have changed it. I knew it was working there. Or this other one from a young uh, gentleman who was a carpenter. He said, yeah, 100%. It's just like when I didn't have the retraining to when I'd done it. It's like chalk and cheese, just chalk and cheese. It done wonders for me, like um, in sensation. So it actually helps to people to reconnect to something that perhaps they hadn't needed or had uh, to be so conscious of before. I understand that the research that you've been involved with has been really focused um, primarily on the use of upper limbs. Is, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Would it be fair to, to say that there's a possibility that this is also transferable to you know, other parts of the body, lower limbs, to, to speech, other functions of the brain as well, or is it too early to... To comment on that type of thing? Yeah, no, I think because the principles are so strongly and robustly centered in the science of neuroplasticity and the science of learning, they they actually come from those fields in, in and of themselves and have now been applied to the sensation through what we've done. Others have used some of those techniques and principles to apply it to loss of sensation, for example, in the lower limb with positive outcomes. Many of the principles of perceptual learning and the context of neuroplasticity are also directly relevant for retraining of movement as they would also be for learning a skill such as articulation and speech. How long does it take on average for somebody to be able to start to see the effects of this kind of retraining? Well, we do quite intensive um, training and over a period of 10 sessions, each of those sessions being one hour each, usually at around two or three times a week with practice in between, is the period and duration of time that um, we've seen clinically significant and statistically significant improvements and changes. So when, when you're pointing to something that's clinically significant, so would that be, say, over the course of a couple of months, six months, that somebody might start to feel a sensation back in, in that area? Or not to sound We're probably spanning, <laughs> so if we've got 10 <laughs> sessions, it's often over a period of four to six weeks uh -huh. at that rate of two or three times a week. And in that time, we can see improvement in standardised assessments of sensation. So that might be touch sensation or texture, knowing where their limb is in space and their ability to recognise everyday objects. Also within that time, we can see improvement in the particular tasks that we've um, been involved with training on. So what we do is we go through a person's daily activities and we identify five activities that they feel are directly impacted by their sensory loss and we train on two of those with them. And so we see what we call as clinically significant improvement in those where um, on the scale, it's been shown to be clinically significant in terms of the amount of improvement in performance. And it's important to know, particularly the one which applies to the person's everyday activities, that's actually self-rated by the individual as well. I'm guessing that, that the feedback through this process is probably vital because I can imagine if I was in the situation, I'd probably myself grow quite impatient and maybe need to, to know that change is happening and that I need to maybe balance out my expectations against the progress, yeah? I think that's one thing that perhaps maps back to what we were saying before about how a person engages is once they start to see those sorts of changes, which they can see quite readily within the first couple of weeks, um, that actually then really is positive and they engage in it and they talk about that that's part of um, them helping to, you know, get back to the positive side, even though they recognise that there's challenges and demands and they've got to work hard at it. One of the things I, I noticed you say, I think in the same presentation I was watching, is that so much of the rehabilitation that uh, people 
people are trying with people with strokes, it's still compensatory. It's not yeah. doing this. How do you kind of spread that message out further? Because it's almost like people need to advocate for themselves to and, and their families to make sure that they are getting the treatment that can help them, um, If they're, yeah. particularly if the immediacy of when you start the treatment is important. No, I think that you, you're very right with that um, on, on two counts. One, if we know that there is this ability to aim for a more restorative to approach to rehabilitation versus compensation, we just have to get it out there because mm. the compensation, the person's not just compensating, they're actually learning non-use of that limb if, if, if they're not using the limb. So mm. it's actually really scary in some way, you know. Uh, and then on the second part, Part of it, we need to make sure that therapists can also have the skills and capabilities to it. So we've actually been working on this in a, what we call a, a partnership project to really work with clinicians, health providers, consumers, research and researchers with the aim to increase the access to more science-based stroke rehab of the arm so that we can achieve these better outcomes. We've developed up some uh, specialist therapy centres as well as also upskilling um, therapists in existing healthcare centres. But there's, there's the two sides to it. There needs to be the belief and the knowledge that there is this pathway. There needs to, alongside that, be the hands-on therapies and protocols that a therapist can learn and feel confident and skilled to deliver. And I think that's where we're looking, obviously, at trying to advance both and to bring them together. But but unfortunately, the plasticity, the knowledge of this plasticity, unfortunately, still is in part in its infancy in stroke rehab. There's certainly, ex- probably, well, whether I'd say exponential or not, but there's certainly a growing realisation in the stroke rehab area that to achieve better outcomes, we need to start aiming for these mistakes more restorative approaches to rehabilitation. We're linking with the knowledge and the science of motor learning, perceptual learning, as well as the neural plasticity to apply that to some interventions. And we're making steps, but I think there's many people um, in the partnership, many stakeholders that we need to draw on uh, both from an advocacy point of view but also from a skill and development point of view to try and escalate this um, as rapidly as we can. Are there learnings or techniques or uh, anything that has come from this process working with um, stroke survivors that we can take out and apply to ourselves as non-stroke survivors to increase our capacities to learn and grow and um, change perhaps behaviours that we need to change? Well, I, I think there are. And again, just going back to the idea that because this is so strongly founded on robust p- principles of neuroplasticity and learning, and many of these principles actually came originally from looking at normal motor learning, normal perceptual learning, and then cross-calibrating that which we need to do with the brain following injury. And I suppose if we um, think about it, even with some of the questions that you've asked, which I think are really important, perhaps even at that first level, really making sure we have a select tasks that are meaningful and graded and varied, that'll help you transfer. And when you're engaged in the task, make sure that you've got a very clear goal in the task. And it could be a sub-goal or it could be a task goal along the way because that will make sure that you then um, direct your attention in a meaningful way because there's this self-organizing capacity as well within the brain. So it's really about if you get to the goal and let the brain do what it needs to do a little bit behind, that's important. And then you want to, if we think about how the brain works, you know, in networks and things, think about how we can use feedback and 
maybe even that calibration to match the experience. I think the anticipation is another key goal that we could use. You know, know what to expect to feel, tune into it. So ready yourself for uh, what it is that's um, your goal for learning. And then the other thing is, you know, the repeat and progress so to bring that into the task. And I, I suppose really one of the one that for us, if things are working well, that really might be the as important or more important is that strategy learning, like to really go in with it to discover what the task is presenting to you and how you can work with that task and manipulate it to achieve the goal, the outcome that works for you. So that metacognition sort of strategy learning as well. I also picked up in, in the reading that we've been doing with re- researching before we um, had a chat this morning, the concept of spontaneity. And it, it seems to me that when it comes to spontaneous use of a limb that you're retraining, there really does need to be some focused uh, attention placed on that limb and it's used to work it back into spontaneous movement is that right yeah yeah even to move one limb or to feel as one limb is very much processed by both sides of the brain and if one's been damaged say by the stroke person will may even well won't necessarily spontaneously use that limb but then a person who's trying to use that limb will, can even report that they have to consciously stop the other limb coming into doing it, mm. to doing the task. So I perceive that as very much a balance of tasks and maybe why it is so important that we have some specially designed tasks and maybe feedback and this belief that you can go on to use that limb, that all coming together are going to be so important to achieve that change. Some conversations I hear around being able to implement some kind of restorative therapy, people are very quick to judge and say we shouldn't actually give people false hope. So what what do you think is the best ammunition against that argument to help fight against that pushback that sometimes you can find even in professional circles of clinicians? I think let people experience it. I mean, I've had, unfortunately, there's been some of the stroke survivors who have come in, they've said, oh, well, no, after three months, I can't expect any more uh, improvement. And mm. so I'm not sure if I should do this or not. And I said, well, if you want to give it a, a, a and then they sort of thought, okay, we'll give it a go. And then in part, it's because of that very expectation that we're, we're even more determined just to give people that opportunity. And that person's an ongoing advocate to say, okay, well, I can actually improve. I can change. It's after three months and now I've got a completely new way that I can use my hand. It might not be 100% of the sensation it was before and we're very sort of clear about um, those sorts of expectations. But as one person says, even if the sensation's not there, they recognise that their brain is making sense of the altered sensation and that they're you know, able then to use it in everyday tasks and, as they say, perform things, you know, quite competently in that way. So I think we've got to break down those barriers. Um, It's happening, but not accept it. How have you uh, applied what you've learned to your own life? How has that made a difference to you? Yeah, I I think there's there's many um, elements of it, perhaps even the partnership way of it the coaching is quite important and and uh, and I suppose more personally you know it it's always taking that discovery approach to learning to look beyond what's just close to you yeah. to see how the other parts working in in conjunction with it to strengthen it to be open to those different ideas and senses and to to really see how the jigsaw comes together and to be very positive and goal-oriented with your approach. And I think both as a therapist and researcher, really having that belief in the change and 
really the power of positive thinking and to know that you can work with a person, be in the moment with them as they're exploring and discovering a new way of sensing and feeling that makes sense for them and then can take them to do what they need and want to be able to do. I think a very common thing we hear throughout society is that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but it seems that any dog, if willing, myself included, I think this dog has kind of learned that I can learn anything right up until the time I leave the earth. Absolutely. So the teach an old dog new tricks is not right. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So you can teach an old dog new tricks. I mean, the saying's not right. You can teach an old dog new tricks. But even better than teaching the old dog new tricks is to teach the dog how to discover new ways of doing things. Love it. And and to me, this is when I hear feedback from stroke survivors that to me is most reinforcing of this therapy. They actually learn the how to do it and so then when I hear that they're using it in everyday activities and I catch up with them years later they say I'm still using that compare with this I do that and such and such they had a problem I told them how to do it Um, and and then it's yeah so it's being open and believing in that discovery of learning it but also having ways that you can bring it together with principles such as this, which are very robust in neuroscience, to actually start on that pathway and continue on it to change. And, you know, it comes back to what we started with. I mean, if you think about reframe the mind, it's about adapting and learning. Neuroplasticity of the brain is the mechanism or the phenomenon that supports that adaptation and learning. And if we engage in the tasks and we believe in this and we've got a little bit of that know-how how how to do it, then we can achieve that change with both the discovery and the knowledge. One of the things I wrote down uh, today that is going to be my big takeaway um, is change your behavior, change the brain. And I would have actually always put it as the other way around. So that's an eye opener. Mm, It is an eye opener. And I think it does challenge us to recognize the reciprocal nature, but also to realize that the control is back with us Mm. in terms of what we can do, not only what we can do to challenge and make that change but also how we experience what we do in terms of making that change so the locus is back with us i just think there's so much significance in that change your behavior change your brain and the reciprocal nature of it yeah you know what something i remember from when we spoke to lisa tarmody was that she said that behavior creates motivation and Mm. i think we often think of it the other way around that we need to get motivated to take action but some of these things that leanne's talking about and even guests prior are really kind of starting to make us think about how we think about things i bloody love leanne she's filled up my brain with lots of things and stuff and that <laughs> but how plastic is it? Well, it's it's Play-Doh at the moment, yeah. or, or maybe one of those kid slime things that I've seen on TikTok. That's what my brain's like. Yeah, right. But still moldable. Good to know. So should we go explore our own brain plasticity now after filling our heads with all those wonderful tidbits? Yeah, look, I think it's a great opportunity for us to unlearn some bad habits and implant some good ones. One small change at a time. You know what? I really do think we need to start putting together a toolkit from everything that we've actually been talking about across the series. I think with some great advice. The reframe of mind toolkit, you mean? The one that we've been talking about for ages that we're going to do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one yes. small step at a time. That's right. <laughs> Definitely more to come. <laughs> <laughs> Next time on Reframe of Mind, we'll dive deeper into thinking about thinking as we have a look at positive psychology and see how this differs from the platitudes of toxic positivity with Australia's own Dr Happy, Tim Sharp. It's okay not to be okay. Sadness and grief and anxiety and frustration and even even anger, and these are normal human emotions. We all experience them and there are usually good reasons for experiencing them. You've been hearing our story. Now we really want to hear yours. Connect with at Reframe of Mind on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok and Twitter. Or connect with at Welcome Change Media on LinkedIn. You can also contact us via reframeofmind.com.au with your stories or suggestions for future topics. 
We'd like to thank today's guests for sharing their personal stories and insights. And for more information on any of the subjects, guests or references used in this episode, please see our show notes or reframeofmind.com.au. Reframe of Mind is a Welcome Change Media production. Ready? Now I'll just introduce some random format. I think I'm going to form it. <laughs> <laughs>